So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Robert Haddad. He's our first speaker of the weekend. Robert, uh, his job, day job, is uh, the head of evangelisation in the Catholic school system. He's written, I'll get this right, 10 books, sold 57,000 copies, and has, is married and has four children. And he only did that a week, that's not too bad. <laughs> I must say though, when, when I was asked to come back, because I was here last year doing a, a talk, I was asked to come back to, uh, to MC this weekend, there was a little bit of trepidation because, you know, I'm not the tallest fella in the world, so I had height and heat. Because all you blokes, I don't know what they do to fellas in Croatia, but it's fair to get. And then I find out that Robert's coming, and he's about three foot taller than all of you. But um, Robert's going to talk to us about what it is to be an authentic man. Catholic men, you know, authentic men. So please put your hands together for Robert. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, thank you for the invitation. I'm always honoured to be invited to speak to any group, in particular a group as fervent as yeah, Croatian men. Um, I want to thank the Vitsa for the invitation in particular. I think groups like this are extremely important. We can't underestimate the importance in the church today of groups like this. Uh, I know about half of you were here last year and half of you were doing something like this for the first time. Maybe it's a bit of a culture shock, a spiritual shock, but I know after two more days of this, there'll be some real change in you for the better. Uh, change is always difficult, change is always scary. We all need conversion, and those who have converted continually need to be on the road of higher or more perfect conversion. And it's never easy, we never do it ourselves. We need each other. We need God, we need the Holy Spirit, we need fidelity to Jesus Christ, we need the church and the sacraments to walk this long road. But it's a beautiful and sweet road if we do it with fidelity. I've been asked to talk about authentic manhood. And it's always dangerous for me to talk about that because I know that I need to hear this talk myself. It's actually easy to stand in front of people and talk about authentic manhood. The reality is it's hard to be an authentic man. And it's more hard than ever because our culture today has an aversion to manhood, has an aversion to fatherhood. Manhood, authentic manhood and fatherhood is being besieged. I'll give you one example of work. Once I made a decision, where I am now, sitting down at the school's office, but this would have been like six or seven years ago. I made a decision, and it was an innocent decision to, sh to sort out a dispute between two of my colleagues, and I came to that conclusion just based on my conscience looking at all the facts. Then one of the parties turned on me ferociously. Happened to be a woman, and I'm not targeting women here, but this person said, oh, boy, oh, father. You're part of the boy club, the boys club. You make a decision just to favour the, the other fellow because you're a man like him. And I said to her, look, I apologise if I make mistakes, but I'm not going to apologise for being a man. It's as simple as that. Because there's nothing wrong with being a man. And there's nothing wrong with being a father. The assault against manhood, the assault against fatherhood is of the devil. It's of the diabolos, the divider. Wherever you see division and conflict, you see the fingerprints of the diabolos, the one who wants to divide in order to destroy. God created man and woman for each other, to be complementary, to uh, love each other, to serve each other, to make each other happy, and to help each other walk on the road to heaven. So what the devil wants to do, the devil wants to frustrate that. And he frustra frust frustrates that by fomenting division and conflict between the sexes. Now, of course, in over the centuries, in years past, we as men, we have made mistakes. We have given grounds to radical feminism to rise up and to now carry this hostile banner against men and fatherhood. And the, the reasons we gave them was because we were not practicing authentic manhood. What is authentic manhood? This is the purpose of the next 35, 40 minutes. 
I'll say from the very beginning something very controversial that in most circles will get me in big trouble. But I believe in Scripture and I believe in the words of St Paul. I believe that the man is the head. I believe that the father is the head of the family. You probably all look for soul to hear that. But what does that mean exactly? What is male leadership? What is fatherhood and the leadership that fathers should give? This is what we need to explore in depth. I can go to one quote and unpack one quote for the rest of the night. But I'll look at this quote as an introduction. And some of you should be all, are very familiar with these words. These are the words of St Paul from his beautiful letter to the Ephesians. If I just ask this question, has anyone ever read St Paul's letter to the Ephesians? Okay. Well, I know I'm talking in front of a Catholic audience now. Okay. Let's read our scriptures, not necessarily like fundamentalists, where they go through and they have to read everything and memorise verses in order to engage in combat and apologetics. But let's have a spiritual program where we will, from time to time, read the scriptures in order to draw from them like a well, where we draw water for life. Okay? And you'll see later on, I'll actually come back to this thing about reading the scriptures in order to build yourself up spiritually. But this is what St. Paul says in chapter 5, verses 21 to 28. Be subject to one another. So he's addressing the Christians in Ephesus. By the way, Ephesus was a Greek city, one of the largest cities in the Greco-Roman Empire on the west coast of Asia Minor, uh, basically Turkey. Okay? And so he's talking to those who converted to Christ and he says, Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. So what does that mean? So that the husband really is in the place of the Lord, is a representative of the Lord. So we must be like the Lord. Moving on. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might make, make present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. There's so much pack in this verse. Just that last sentence there. He who loves his wife loves himself. Because in marriage, the man and the woman, it's a covenant, it's more than a contract, it's a covenant, and a covenant involves total self-giving to each other. Mutual self-giving so that the two become morally one. That's why St. Paul would say, Love when you love your wife, you love yourself because your wife has become part of you and you have become part of her. That's why I know it's not the trend these days, these words are very counter revolutionary. These words will not go well down well in most circles in society today. They'll be labeled as misogynistic, patriarchal, oppressive, domineering, etc. Okay? Because they don't understand the spirit of it. And some men might misinterpret to justify a type of leadership where they are domineering and oppressive or aggressive or abusive or tread their wives and their children under their feet where they rule like an oppressive king over subjects where the wife and the children exist for the benefit of the husband and the father. Some have acted like that in the past. 
and in doing that, I have illustrated inauthentic men, and they've given fuel to radical feminism to attack men and fatherhood in general. The father, the husband, does not have this role for his own glory. The wife and the children do not exist for the glory of the husband and the father. The husband and the father, he exists for the glory and the sake of his wife and his children. Now, if I finish there, I think I've said enough. And there's fuel there, there's material there for meditation. You, in your manhood, in your fatherhood, in your leadership, you exist for the sake of others. You exist for the glory of others. And it's mutual. That's why St. Paul says at the beginning of this, of this quote, mutual submission. That doesn't mean that, there's, that the, the husband and the father is not the head, but the two exist for each other and serve each other's need in partnership. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself here and I'm packing this, but okay. Last point I'll make about St. Paul here. He compares the headship, the leadership of the man and of the father, like Christ, loving his wife and children. I know he doesn't mention children here, but I keep throwing that in, okay? Right? Loving his wife and children like Christ loved the church. And the ultimate expression of how Christ loved the church, we see where? We see on the cross. We see on the cross a voluntary self-sacrifice of total self-giving love to God the Father on behalf of the human race, on behalf of the human family. Christ as the new Adam is doing something on the cross to reverse the damage and disobedience caused by the first Adam. So Christ loves and he loves to the point of death. And this is the hard bit. Oh, it's easy to read St. Paul and say, oh great, it says there that my wife is, you know, has to obey me, I'm the head. You know, I'm not denying that. But what's the quid pro quo here? Those famous words recently with respect to Donald Trump. Quid pro quo, it's a legal term. I give you something, what do you give me in return? If you are to obey me, what am I going to give back to you? Well, Christ gives us the model. He gives us the example. Look at the cross. There's another look at the spiritual practice you can embody into your daily life, your practice. Look at the cross. Total, unselfish, sacrificial love for the other. So, you want your wife to obey you? You want your children to respect you and obey you? What do you give in return? A willingness to live for them, to self-sacrifice to the, for them, to give up everything if necessary, to sacrifice everything if, if necessary for them. How do we know Christ sacrificed everything? Not just by looking at the wounds on, through his hands and his feet, through the piercings of the nails on the cross, we know he gave everything by looking at that fifth wound in his side. Because what came out of that fifth wound? Blood and water. His heart was empty. He was bled white. He gave everything for the sake of his spouse. So Christ, the new Adam, is asleep on the cross. And like the first Adam in Genesis, his spouse is born from his side while he is asleep. And the new Adam is asleep on the cross and his spouse is born from his side. And the spouse of Christ is the church. And we become a part of that, we become members of that. Members of the church, members of Christ through baptism, signified, symbolized by the water from Christ's side. And we have the Eucharist, symbolized by the blood from Christ's side. Christ feed, gives birth and feeds his spouse. And he does that through a total self-sacrifice in death on the cross. And that's the model for us. This is when we are authentic. This is when we are real men. When we are real husbands. When we are real fathers. 
when we are Christian warriors. This is what we, how we fight. This is the sacrifice we make. We deny ourselves. We conquer ourselves. Now, I see a couple of swords to my left. I'm impressed. Okay? That one thing Croats and Lebanese have in common, we both have a traumatic history. We were both under the Turks. We were under the Turks for 400 years and you probably something very similar. Okay, when I saw the swords there, I said, what, are you expecting the Turks to come back? Okay, well, we hope they don't. Okay, but that's, that warfare had spiritual motivation. But you're, you are in another warfare with a higher spiritual motivation and your enemy is more deadly than the Turks. Your deadliest enemy is yourself. My deadliest enemy is myself. Why do I say that? Because of the wounds of original sin that drag me down. I know myself. You need to know yourself. The best thing about a retreat is that we come to self-realisation. The Holy Spirit gives you knowledge about yourself. You come to a realisation that, you know, there are many good aspects about me, thanks God. I'm doing some good things, wonderful, but I've got gaps in the backlog. I've got problems, I've got deficiencies. I'm enlightened by the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit and I need the grace of God now to rise up to the next level to be that authentic man. I know what, it, what one needs to do, what one needs to be to be an authentic man, an authentic leader, husband and father. I like support, I know. But I have another force within myself that drags me down. I wax and wane. I'm like that roller coaster. Well, I can be unselfish. And then I can descend and I can be very selfish. I know when I'm at my best. I'm always at my best when I am unselfish, when I am self-sacrificing, when I'm denying myself. Little examples in the home. When the phone rings when I'm having a siesta, I don't want to get up to answer it. Someone else can answer it. I'm being selfish. When the, one of my kids rings from the train station and says, Dad, can you pick me up when I'm in the middle of something? I, I don't want to get up now and do that. I'm being selfish, not sacrificial. When my wife asks for, if I could do my own ironing or wash some, my own underwear sometimes, I'm like, well, that, that's your job. Because I want her to do it. Because I don't want to do it because I'm selfish. I know that I'm not the real man when I suffer from selfishness. Okay, we'll come back to this thing. I'm going to give you an acronym. SLAP. An acronym is a word made of four different letters that stand for other words. So I'm going to throw that at you now. SLAP. Remember that. Because we're going to come and analyse that. And I'm going to offer you that word, it's a simple word for you to remember. I don't like to give talks where I have to, I give you 101 ways to be the perfect man, the perfect father, because you're going to be overwhelmed with too many ideas, too many suggestions, you think, well that's too much, I can't do it. So as a result of this presentation, by the end of it, I just want you to remember one word, slap, and we'll come back to it. And it's the word I use on myself to remind myself in my bad moments, in, my, in, in a bad time, when my roller coaster is down low and not high, I speak about slap to myself. I pray about slap to myself. Okay? So, headship, authentic leadership, authentic manhood is one, not about domination. It's about partnership, it's about being complementary. It's about mutual submission. Man and woman are like jigsaw pieces, made for each other. Not just physically, emotionally, culturally, socially, spiritually. 
The man is the head, but the woman is the heart, and therefore she has a role in leadership. You're a human being, you have a head, you have a brain, but you also have a heart. And if you're just a head and just a brain, you would not be a man, you would not be a human being, you wouldn't be alive, you wouldn't be functional. The family is not functional if it just has a head. It needs a head. There are times you have to be decisive and you have to be the one, you as the man, as the husband, as the father, you have to be the one that makes the decision. But there has to be that respect, that consultation, that discussion, that conversation. That conversation with the heart. So, a heart without a head cannot live. A head without a heart cannot live. The two go together. If it was just a heart, then there will be too much emotion, not tempered by logic. If it was just the head, there will be too much logic, not tempered by emotion and love. They need each other. That's how I like to put it. When I sometimes, where I operate, difficult territory sometimes, when I say the husband, the man is the head, I get to feel the anger rise. But when I then say that the heart, you're the heart, and the heart is necessary, it's so core, so important, so essential, then the anger subsides a little bit. Because no one, whether you're male or female, man or woman, boy or girl, no one wants to be excluded and marginalised. An authentic leadership manhood does not exclude and marginalise. You have to be that exemplar. I can tell you now why faith is not being passed on in so many families. Because the man is not showing it. you got boys, you don't pray, you don't go to Mass, you're not on your knees praying at home, invisibly in front of others, you don't go to confession, your boys will imitate you. Your wife, she prays, goes to Mass, goes to confession, prays the rosary, wears the veil, that's cool, that's wonderful, that'll have impact. But if the husband's not doing anything, the children won't, the boys, will not follow the mother necessarily. They'll follow the dad. That's the seriousness of your calling, of your vocation. To be authentic, you need to be the exemplar. You need to practice integrity. As a teacher, I learned very quickly, when you're teaching teenagers, they can see right through you. I can be in the classroom, this is the classroom of adults, and I can talk about Virtue, holiness, integrity, obeying the Ten Commandments, being honest, I can mention all that. And I'm saying doing the, saying the right thing, saying what I must say. But my students know, if you know Robert Haddad lies, cheats, never declares his income for, on his tax returns, commits adultery, whatever, whatever, then no matter what I say, you're not going to listen to me. You're not going to follow me. I am empty, hollow words. To be authentic in your manhood, as a husband and a father, you have to talk the talk, walk the walk. The walk has to match the talk. And your, those in your family, if they see that, they will be inspired. If they see your, if your children see you praying, you put it in the effort, put it in the hard yard, making the sacrifices, praying that rosary that takes 15 to 20 minutes, bothering to go to confession, that is where they get the inspiration to do likewise. Don't rely on the school to pass on the faith. I say that as an educator, working in head office. Don't rely on the school or the teachers to pass on the faith to your children. You have to be the example. Because that's your responsibility. Parents exist before schools. If there are no schools, you would be the school. You have the responsibility. We have the ones, we are the ones to account again for what we did, how we led, 
how we inspire, what level of ex example we gave to our children. You have to defend your home like Adam was meant to defend his garden. Adam fell, Eve fell, the human family fell because Adam did not defend the boundaries of his home. He let the serpent in. He let the serpent whisper. He let the serpent lie and divide and destroy. You want to be authentic? You want to have a sword? You defend your home. Meaning, what are you allowing in your home by way of other influences? You be the chief instrument, the chief influence in your home. Not the television, not the internet, not the YouTube, not the social media, not the media mainstream or any other stream. I'm not saying block them all out, I'm saying be the guardian, be the gatekeeper, let in what's good, keep out what's bad. You are no longer the man, you are no longer the father. If you are letting others have a louder voice in your home than you, you have to be the guardian. If Adam fulfilled his role as the guardian, we wouldn't be in the trouble we are as a humanity. And if trouble comes into your home, it's because of someone else's influence over your children or your wife overrode your influence. And you probably let it happen, maybe unwittingly. All right, remember when I spoke about SLAP, I'm conscious of the time? SLAP, what does SLAP stand for? It's not boom, boom, boom like that, okay? It's selfishness, lust, anger, and pride. If we meditate and focus on ourselves, all of us, myself, all of us, We'll see elements of that plaguing ourselves. When I've had issues in my own home, in my own household, when I see conflict and division, I ask the Holy Spirit to come into my home to drive out the conflict and division. I invite the Holy Spirit into my home. But then I invite it also the Holy Spirit into my heart. And I ask the Holy Spirit to slap down, slap. Knock it down. Conquer what's in me that is the problem. Conquer my selfishness. So I look at my wife, not in a selfish way, but as a gift from God. Dorothaeus. Dorothy means gift of God. My wife is the Dorothaeus. The one, I'm, the one I'm not only to live with, but to live for. I ask this in prayer. To conquer my selfishness, I don't see her as my servant, but the one that we, that we, her and I live together for each other, as that gift from God. Now sometimes it's hard for me to think of my wife as a gift from God. When there are moments, tensions and things. And we all have it. I don't think I'm revealing too much. I think we all have, except for Joseph, okay? The rest of us do. And when I really have those issues, I think about my wife as the gift from God that brings me peace. My children are also the are gifts from God. So, when I see them as gifts from God, I realize that I have to live for them. And that conquers my selfishness, helps to conquer my selfishness. Then I look at the L for lust. Lust is not love. Lust is when I look at the other to use them as an object only for my own pleasure. And I divorce that from everything else. Now, we're meant to have pleasure. Absolutely. Not a problem. Don't feel good about having pleasure there. But if you're only seeking the pleasure and you're reducing the other to an object, then you're coming back to selfishness. Let that be an expression 
of agape love. The highest form of love is agape love, the love of self-sacrifice. The different types of love, eros romantic love, philia the love of friendship, brotherhood, storge the love of authority figures caring for their children, and agape love is the love of self-sacrifice for the, for the other. For another. That's what Christ is. You look at the cross, it's a garbage line. Let what you do with your spouse sexually be an expression of a garbage line. That unselfish, sacrificial form of love. Then I come to the A. And the A stands for anger. Now I'm, from the, I'm from the Middle East. Plenty of anger. I, I have potential for great anger. As a teacher in the classroom, I was ferocious sometimes. I was ferocious in the staff room. It's taken me years to subdue the anger. The anger in the home is dangerous. How do I respond? My prayer in those situations. I think about sometimes, you know, no one's perfect. I'm not perfect. My wife's not perfect. Sometimes when my wife talks to me, I'm tempted. Maybe the mockery, the marginalisation, you know, the uh, putting me aside, ridicule, whatever it is, I feel like I get angry. How do I respond? This is my greatest weakness. Out of the four, the S A B, this is where I fall the most, my anger. How do I respond when I'm provoked? I ask for the last Holy Spirit to subdue my anger. So I respond with gentleness, calmness, but also at the same time, so I'm not weak in a whim, I ask that I respond gently and calmly, but with clarity and assertiveness. I probably achieved that twice in the last 12 months. And when I have achieved that, I feel liberated. I feel free. That I can have those hard conversations without the anger that puts her down, that, that belittles her and goes, causes her to go silent for the next three weeks. And when I do it with that clarity and firmness, I don't feel weak. I feel strong. But it's not a strength that has crushed another. And then the last one, the P. The pride. Selfishness, lust, anger and pride. We all have pride. Pride is the cause of the fall. God is a liar. You eat the fruit of that tree, you become like God in knowledge. We were deceived by a lie. Our egos were inflamed. We, the pride is a lie. We want it to be something we can never be. We wanted to be like God in knowledge. And that pride led to rebellion. My pride causes me to desire to be something else, to desire to be someone else, to desire to be more important people, to desire <coughs> to be favoured by other people. I'm living the lie. I'm not living in the truth. I'm not living as the person God has created me to be. I ask to live in humility and truth, <coughs> to rejoice in the person God has created me to be, to recognise and rejoice and give thanks for the gifts he has given me, and to rejoice and give thanks for the vocation he has given me. We all have vocation. You are all called. The fact that you exist means you have vocation, meaning you have been called to something. If you don't just, whatever, whatever age you are, you can still ask God tonight, tomorrow, whenever. Show me what you want me to do for the rest of my life. And that's where you find peace, purpose, direction. So much anxiety and depression in the world is not due just to chemical imbalances in the brain. It's due to lack of fulfillment, lack of purpose. 
and as we become more agnostic and more atheistic in our culture and our society, we'll only see greater levels of anxiety and depression. Search, discern through prayer for your vocation. Make, ask God to clarify for you what you should be, what you should be what your gifts are, what you should do in life, and live in that truth. And we can't do this by ourselves. <clears throat> to slap down slap, you can't do it by yourselves. You will never do it. You might go two or three days where you're unselfish, where you're authentically loving, where you subdue your anger, where you're living in humility. You might go two or three weeks, but you will not do it for the long term by yourself. When you slap down slap, you are the authentic man. You are the authentic husband and father. You are the authentic leader in your home, whereby you exist for the glory and for the sake of the others in your home, to lead them to the heavenly Jerusalem.